Welcome back to our Chess Masters of the Past series, everyone. And today we get to see a prodigy from Hungary by the name of Guayla Breyer. So up to a certain point in chess, maybe up to 1910, 1920, everybody said you have to put the pawns in the middle. You have to bring your knight toward e5 and d4 and e4, and you have to play classical chess, put pieces on good squares, build up the center, and then try to mate them like Steinitz did and Tarash along with him. Then there came along another type of chess player who said, actually, do I have to play towards the center or can I just look at the center? Can I just control the center from afar with my Fianchetto bishops uh, with a6, b5, bishop, b7? And that player was the hypermodern player. One of the first hypermodern players was actually a guy named Guela Breyer. And Breyer made up many, many things in chess, including the Breyer variation of the Roy Lopez. So if you don't know, it looks something like a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castle, uh, let's say bishop b7. And then after rook e1, b5, the bishop has to run back. We play something like d6. White says, I want to build up the center. Black says, go ahead, but I have a pin. So white says, no, you don't. And black says, fine, I don't. But then I can defend the center with my knight. And this weird move, knight b8, was actually Breyer's. That's why we call it the Breyer variation, because he told us about it way back in the year 1911. And he said, let's bring the knight here where he doesn't block anything. He can chase the bishop, chase the center, and also make way for the pawns who are coming to help. So that's not a bad idea, and we still play to this day. Perfectly fine move. All right. So then... Tarash didn't like this hyper-modern chess. He said, no, you have to play classical. And so this is really a clash between two types of chess schools. Let's see who wins. We start with the Royal Lopez in the open variation. So when Black takes his pawn, this is called the open Royal Lopez. When Black says no and takes out a bishop, that's the closed Royal Lopez with rook e1, protecting it. In this game, we got the open Royal Lopez and so far so good. He kicks out the bishop. Breyer goes back, he's white, playing Tarash, one of the greatest classical players of all time. And d5, protecting the knight. So far, this has been seen hundreds, if not thousands of times, to this day. To this day, we're still playing all these moves, and now the pawn has to take. Uh, we put pressure on this guy, so this guy must be defended the best way is with the bishop from e6. White says, later on, can I, like trade off your good knight and also later on can i like get a nice diagonal for my bishop and also later on can you not trade off my good bishop for your ugly knight or for your pretty knight but i still like my bishop pair so black says that's okay regardless i'm gonna have nice bishops and i'm very solid i have the center everything is fine white says sure that's fine with me too i'm gonna take out my bishop trade off your good knight black says okay and we castle so far so good White says, what are you doing about your good knight, sir? What's he doing? He's not going back home. I mean, you could, but, you know, then he could be awkward and I can kick him later on. And he's not as good as he was earlier. So are you going to trade off for my ugly knight? Because the truth is, that's not the knight white wants. We call them superfluous because they're stepping on each other's heels, right? Like this guy wants to come over here. This guy wants to come over here. They both can't just jump on d4. So that's why they're not exactly best friends. But in any case, black plays the hideous, hideous f5. Why is it so hideous? Because e6 was the blockading square, right? As long as e6 was well guarded, as long as the bishop was here, everything was solid and you can't break through. For some reason, Tarash says, hmm, I have to keep the knight there. Let's be stubborn. So he tries to keep the knight in the middle, but he pays a very high price for f5 you already have a weird pawn structure you already have a bunch of pawn islands all over the place this pawn is already weird you can't afford to make any more weird pawns and now you have like one pawn island two pawn island three pawn island four pawn islands five pawn islands okay that's very strange in my eyes i'm sure he wants to keep the horsey on d4 but you know that's a big price to pay for the knight on d4 um a better move maybe is knight c5 and yes bishop can run back but at least it's a game at least it's playable instead after f5 he forgot about ampassant i think maybe he underestimated it he just didn't see it 
whatever the reason, he decided to allow en passant. And after en passant, the problem is, what kind of bishop is this? This whole diagonal is breaking apart. I like to call this game the light square clinic. Because after the next move, boom, knight g5, the light squares are falling down. Okay? Uh, you can't protect everything. Okay? If you go back to like f5, then the whole diagonal is breaking down. Uh, I'm already looking at moves like maybe queen f3, maybe knight f3. Even with knight f3, um, I'm already coming after this guy. Now, that being said, um, I can use this pin in many ways. Right? So, whichever way, this square is going to be weak. Uh, something like rook to e1 followed by 96 later on is going to be painful and this whole diagonal is just screaming for mercy um so he decided to keep the diagonal or at least try to keep it with bishop f7 um something like bishop g4 doesn't look nice either because after let's say queen c2 i think i can get away with that and h3 if your bishop ever goes there i have knight e six already i'm looking at tactics like bishop takes d5 if the queen goes away let's say right queen e8 uh oh tactics because your knight is overloaded in too many places so because you can't get away with bishop g4 he chose bishop f7 that being said you're not really keeping the diagonal with the bishop traded because i will get the bishop pair without you having to ask twice i'll just take the bishops now i have the bishop pair you have the ugly knight pair. This is not the type of pretty knight that can fight with my light square bishop. The funny thing is, uh, Tarash used to say that the future belongs to he who has the bishop. In this game, it's really the future belongs to he who has the better bishop. And he who has the better bishop is, of course, Breyer. So after the trade, we got knight of three because one fork isn't enough. We need to bring another in here. Okay. After knight to g5, e6, we're going to fork your rook and your queen, along with other things, and perhaps your king as well. Uh, if you try to block it, you're just making more holes. This is not the sort of move you can afford to make, okay? After bishop here, bishop here, oh my goodness, uh, this will be a complete massacre on the light squares, which you can no longer protect, okay? Um, you know... A computer may, may look at this and say, oh, he didn't play the greatest game. Oh, he should have played bishop c2. Oh, he should have gone right for uh, the light squares and tried to stick something on a five. But let me tell you how a human would think about this position, right? So a human looks at the last few moves and says, okay, I destroyed the light square bishops. What's next on the agenda of light squares? The only thing that's keeping me from light square domination is light square pawns. If I could just get rid of a few, that would be really great. If I get rid of your d5 pawn, if this guy disappears, magically you lose. That's it. Not with a bishop like that. You can't survive that. All right. So how can I get rid of the pawn? Who's protecting this pawn? Hmm, it's already soft. I softened it up a little bit. Um, now, if only I could get rid of your knight. If the knight was gone, this, this whole thing is falling apart. So, of course, we trade him. We don't care about your bishops. We don't care about the dark squares. They're not scary. What's scary is that you already lost one pawn on the light squares. The other one is weak and you have no light square bishop to fix it. Your queen isn't capable of holding the team on her back. Okay, so that means we trade off this knight. And even with the other knight coming to help, that's not enough. Okay, after takes, uh, you can take with the rook, not that you want to, because boom. And the light squares fall down. Okay. Since you can't take with the rook, you must take with the pawn. Not that you want to, because what happened to the pawns? This is not exactly a kosher pawn structure. Not the type of pawns you'd like to have. All right. And the rook is closed down. You can try to use the G file. He should have tried to use the G file, but it's uh, too little too late. The best move here is, of course, bishop c2, going for the light squares and saying that. You know, we're very centralized, your knight is weird, your dark squares don't do anything, and I have the better bishop because I have the better attack. We have opposite color bishops, so the attacker he should win. Not always wins, but should win, all right? So that's what should have happened. But at this point, Breyer gets inspired. 
he breathes a sigh of fresh air and says, I'm ready for a masterpiece. Instead of a normal move, like bishop c2, yeah? First he brings in the rook, and now comes the uh, fun part, okay? Up to here, it's a normal game. Okay, black says, I'm going to fix my light squares, so your bishop can't do anything. And Breyer goes for extra. Okay, he, go, he goes for bonus points because after knight d4, he's committed to a sacrifice. c5, c4 is coming, and I'm sure he saw that, okay? He knows this is coming, but this is what he's thinking, right? He's thinking something like, I want to destroy your light squares. This pawn is really annoying. Maybe one day I can take queen takes and I destroy all of them. Also, let's say uh, rook takes, um, bishop takes. Let's say rook takes, bishop takes e7. Knight takes e6, queen takes, bishop takes d5, and your light squares are demolished. Okay, that's the plan. And Black says, can you get out of here? I don't like your knight nearby. If Black kept the pawn there, then I think he would have sacrificed. As it is, he sacrifices anyways. Kaboom. Okay. And later on, he's going to have another few nice moves. Okay, but this is the start of the light square clinic after getting rid of the knight who's protecting d5 only the queen the bishop had to take to keep d5 intact after knight of five it looks like this just wins a piece so the whole attack is over did he just blunder for no reason well i'd leave it to you to find out if you are white here what would you do this is actually a tricky one all right it's your turn. I'll give you three seconds. Feel free to pause the video and try to find the right idea. Three, two, one, fire. Okay, and the answer is, congratulations if you played queen h3. I know a lot of my students would look at checks right away. They say, oh, Mr. Mike, it's a check, it's a check. The check isn't really doing much. After king h8, your bishop is still hanging. The knight is not doing great. And bishop c2 is all right. It's not the end of the world. But after rook g8, why did we give away the file for no reason? If we're going to have to move, why not just go there right away? The right idea is, of course, queen h3. Saying hello to the queen, hello to the fork, and welcome back to the bishop who gets the chance to move. Okay. Anything else, like queen d2, you just lose the piece. Okay. Queen b1, you lose the piece. But queen h3 keeps the threats on, keeps the pressure, okay? After bishop of eight, that's very, very passive, okay? His bishop can't do anything. Uh, this is a light square clinic because it's not a dark square clinic. The bishop never got to do anything. He never got to show what he's capable of, and that's why the opposite color bishops killed him here, okay? You can't fight with opposite color bishops like this. He had to play bishop c5 or something active, keeping the queen safe. So even after, let's say, fork, Okay, a fork is a fork, but it's not the end of the world. After maybe something like check, queen takes, bishop c2. Okay, it's not a great picture. It's not a great position, but it's playable. This is still a game. Whereas in the game, it was not a game. Okay, after bishop of 8 is just a massacre on the light squares. The bishop is coming to h5. He's going to be down material soon anyways. There is no way to keep all the extra ice cream for himself. Uh, after rook d7, he's just wasting time, right? How many moves did he waste? One passive move, two passive moves, three passive moves. And look at this domination. The bishop ensured the highway for white to make sure nobody is fighting me for the e-file along with the knight. The rooks can never, ever come in. And if the rooks don't come in, then the attack will finish things off. Let's go finish this game. Ready? Queen h4, we're coming into his house, saying hi to the weakness. This guy, another passive piece. Okay. He wishes he could be like, I don't know, on g8 right now, but not in this world. Okay. Bishop g7, the saddest bishop you'll ever see. Okay. Complete domination from white pieces. The bishop is dominating light squares. Knight is dominating the e7 square all the squares around here, and the dark square bishop, okay? And here comes the light square continuation, okay? Not only do we dominate light squares, we also 
common for your king's light squares, okay? We cut him off from his friends, so his friends cannot help. Uh, if you try to run this way, I don't think you're going to live very long because now my queen comes in the light squares too. Anything you do will not help. If the king takes, sorry, doesn't help either because of the discovery, okay? So that's game over. And if he tried to run the other way, like he did in the game, that's not going to help because check and the light square... Uh, disaster continues okay uh, after check check he wants to repeat moves because we always want to repeat moves just to show that we can in chess don't repeat three times that would be horrific okay after bishop f7 we're saying maiden one how are you liking my light squares now oh you you want to give me more light squares you want to make more holes by putting more pawns in the dark squares well he had to stop mate somehow that was the only way but even after that queen h5 comes in and we're steeping in through the holes you've made okay uh they try to destroy the light squares but okay check at the very least we can get your rook but do we want your rook you know a lot of people would just take and then life goes on rook takes and life goes on this is not clear he said no 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 my knight and bishop are stronger than any rook you will ever have here i'm not trading anything if i can just mate you right so uh you know what the threat is with bishop e6 he actually wants mate he wants queen of five complete light square domination the king can't run so check and mate coming up no matter what okay and if you want to try and stop it you have to throw away pawns after you throw away pawns we say hello to the king and it's not so easy for him to survive here yeah uh first of all after something like that check and time for a bathroom okay the rocket ship is coming and if you want to try and block this way check takes everything takes the rook finally and the only reason we take the rook is because you can't defend without the rook okay the queen makes a really bad defender if she tries to help over here i think we just seep in through the light squares with something like this this is complete complete domination as much as i get tired of saying that it is though right because we can put the pawn on h5 you can't defend something like this for long and if you play queen g5 hoping to offer a queen trade why bother if we can just mate okay rook e8 finishes the game because of rook takes queen takes bishop here and made soon thereafter let me show you boom 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 blocks boom blocks boom checkmate okay so a very nice light square clinic by brayer showing his understanding of chess showing that he could play on the same level as all these guys like tarash Ewe, who he beat later on and all the other world champions it's really sad that he died at a very young age of 28 because uh, along with this masterpiece, he had very, very nice games that will hopefully remember him throughout chess history. Okay, uh, thanks for watching and until next time. Bye-bye.